Director of Emergencies, and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, but also Mr. David Clark, Team Leader for Universal Health Coverage and Health Systems Law. As usual, we'll pr be providing the simultaneous translation in all six languages, all six UN languages, plus Portuguese, and if you prefer to ask your questions in any of those languages, please, please do. You may also listen in Hindi, but you cannot ask, in, ask your question in Hindi. And now I will hand over to Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. More than 15 million cases of COVID-19 have now been reported to WHO, and almost 620,000 deaths. Although all countries have been affected, we continue to see intense transmission in a relatively small group of countries. Almost 10 million cases, or two-thirds of all cases globally, are from 10 countries, and almost half of all cases reported so far are from just three countries. As we have said previously, political leadership and community engagement are the two vital pillars of the response. One of the tools governments can use is the law, not to coerce, but to protect health while protecting human rights. Yesterday, WHO, the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and Georgetown University launched the COVID-19 Law Lab a database of laws that countries have implemented in response to the pandemic. It includes state of emergency declarations, quarantine measures, disease surveillance, legal measures relating to mask wearing, physical distancing, and access to medication and vaccines. Well-designed laws can help to build strong health systems, evaluate and approve safe and effective drugs and vaccines, and enforce actions to create healthier and safer public spaces and workplaces. However, laws that are poorly designed, implemented, or enforced can harm marginalized populations entrench stigma and discrimination and hinder efforts to end the pandemic. The database will continue to grow as more countries and themes are added. But even more powerful than the law is giving people the information they need to protect themselves and others. The best way to suppress transmission and save lives is by engaging individuals and communities to manage their own risk and take evidence-based decisions to protect their own health and that of those around them. The pandemic has disrupted the lives of billions of people. Many have been at home for months. It's completely understandable that people want to get on with their lives. But we will not be going back to the old normal. The pandemic has already changed the way we live our lives. Part of adjusting the new normal is finding ways to live our lives safely. It can be done. But how to do it will depend on where you live and your circumstances. It's all about making good choices. We're asking everyone to treat the decisions about where they go, what they do, and who they meet with as life and death decisions, because they are. It may not be your life, but your choices could be the difference between life and death for someone you love or for a complete stranger. In recent weeks, we have seen outbreaks associated with nightclubs and other social gatherings, even in places where transmission had been suppressed. We must remember that most people are still susceptible to this virus. As long as it's circulating, everyone is at risk. 
Just because cases might be at a low level where you live, that doesn't make it safe to let down your guard. Don't expect someone else to keep you safe. We all have a part to play in protecting ourselves and one another. First, know your situation. Do you know how many cases were reported where you live yesterday? Do you know where to find that information? Second, do you know how to minimize your exposure? Are you being careful to keep at least one meter from others? Are you still cleaning your hands regularly? Are you following the advice of your local authorities? No matter where you live or how old you are, you can be a leader in your community, not just to defeat the pandemic, but to build back better. In recent years, we have seen young people leading grassroots movements for climate change and racial equality. Now, we need young people to start a global movement for health, for a world in which health is a human right, not a privilege. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. I will now open the floor for questions. Uh, I will remind you that, uh, as usual, please, just one question per person, as we have huge numbers of journalists and, and limited time. Most of you know this already, but those here for the first time, please use the raise your hand icon to ask a question. Now I will go to the many people lining up for questions. The first one is from Jamie Keaton, Associated Press. Jamie, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, actually, my question ties into what uh, Dr. Tedros had just mentioned about um, governments and, um, and laws and whatnot. Um, my question has to do with um, how worried you are about the mixed messages that we're getting from governments about mandatory but ultimately voluntary quarantines and how important is it that people respect them? Is there any evidence that people ignoring these quarantines has increased case counts? Um, and just as a final on that, your, if I understand correctly, your last uh, recommendations on quarantines date from um, March 19th. I'm just wondering if you're planning on updating those at all soon. Thanks. Um. Yeah, the issues on, uh, I'm, Jimmy, I'm going to assume you're referring to quarantine measures in relation to context. There are different interpretations because in some cases people talk about quarantine measures in relation to travelers arriving from another country who are not necessarily contacts of a case. And then there's quarantine for people who are documented contacts of cases. In the case of uh, uh, contacts of uh, confirmed cases, WHO's recommendation is that uh, all such contacts should be quarantined for a period of 14 days. That quarantine can occur in a, in a, in a facility or it can occur uh, in the person's home as long as there's an appropriate way for that individual to isolate themselves from, from others who are not designated as contacts. Um, and uh, we do believe, and <clears throat> Maria may speak to some of the evidence on this, in countries that have been <clears throat> successful in implementing that uh, have made a lot of progress, especially in shutting down, and you see as it with uh, shutting down of clusters in particular. It's not so obvious in the middle of uh, community transmission as it takes time for that impact to occur, but we've seen some pretty intense clusters of cases shut down fairly quickly when quarantine has been implemented successfully. In, 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 in context. The, the DG obviously spoke to the issue of public health law. Um, quarantining oneself uh, when you are a contact is, uh, is an act of uh, courage and it's an act of contribution to society. If you're a contact of a case, then you are much more likely than any other person around you to develop the disease and potentially transmit it to somebody else. It is much, much better if someone is ready, willing, and able to quarantine themselves on behalf of their community. Uh, but there are situations in which uh, that is um, 
not the case. And some governments uh, have public health law in place that allows them to make that a mandatory procedure. In other words, it's mandated by law. Um, if it is such, and I think WHO's guidance is also clear, and I think we do clearly state, that where such mandatory quarantine rules are in place, the state implementing that mandate must also respect the human rights of the individual. They must be in a position to provide an appropriate level of support and care to that individual. That should not cost that individual in terms of extra out-of-pocket expenses for the purposes of staying in a hotel. You cannot, we don't recommend that governments charge people for being quarantined. So there's a whole load of issues that are associated with that issue. So sometimes a mandatory nature of quarantine allows a government in law to provide more support to people being quarantined. Uh, but uh, we do uh, and are against coercive procedures. And in our experience, yes, it may be that people may say making these things um, uh, uh, to be implemented coercively, it gets the job done. Well, in our experience in WHO and dealing with uh, communities, particularly marginalised and other communities, it can do exactly the opposite. It can shove the problem underground uh, and it can mean that people are unlikely to report their status in terms of either being a case or being a contact if they feel they will be unfairly treated. So it is exceptionally important that we build <coughs> uh, strong community engagement, that people, individuals and communities understand how the disease is spread understand the role they can play in the transmission of the disease and understand the role they can play in breaking those chains of transmission. In our experience, when people understand that fact, when they understand their own personal status and when they're supported in the process, most, the vast majority of people will participate in the quarantine mechanism. Uh, and we would like to avoid uh, coercive mechanisms to do that. <coughs> Maria? Thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, I think indeed uh, quarantine in the context of contact tracing is arguably, you know, one of the most important elements to breaking chains of transmission. Isolation of cases, known cases in facilities outside of the home in particular, if that can be done. And if inside the home it's among uh, someone who is experiencing mild disease or no disease, or among an individual who does not have risk factors that would um, put them at a higher risk of developing severe disease or dying. But quarantining of contacts is incredibly important. Um, we will be updating our guidance. In fact, we're doing it now. It's, it's almost as if you knew that, uh, Jamie. Um, but we are updating it at the moment, uh, and it won't actually change that much. Uh, what we're changing um, in it is looking at, currently we require uh, testing at the end of the quarantine day period, and we will be removing that. Um, but we're also going to add language in there to ensure that family units are uh, taken care of. And so making sure that the language that's in there really focuses on children and isolation of and quarantining of children with family members and parents so that they're not separated. So that should be coming out hopefully in the next uh, week or so, uh, but it won't look that different uh, to what the current version is online. Um, and it does really remain a, an essential element to breaking chains of transmission. Thank you, Dr. Van Kerkhoff and Dr. Ryan. Uh, we now have a question from South Africa, from Sophie, from the South African Broadcasting Commission. Sophie, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? My question is directed to the Director General. Uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, I saw on your Twitter account you spoke to the Minister of Health of South Africa. What was this all about? And the update on the China delegation uh, of WHO is directed by the World Health Assembly to start the investigation. How far? That's two questions. With regard to uh, South Africa, <clears throat> the, the DG will speak to this, but um, the situation in, in South Africa, uh, as you know, uh, the numbers have been increasing and uh, the government are obviously looking at every possible measure to increase the intensity of the response there in support of their communities. Uh, and as part of that due diligence <clears throat> and, and reaching out for support and assistance and advice, 
the, the, uh, the Minister of Health and his Director General, as well as other staff in the Ministry, have been reaching out to our regional office uh, in Africa, to our regional director, Chidi Moeti, but also directly to the Director General. And uh, our re most recent conference call was a three-level conference call in which we were discussing the challenges uh, that South Africa has faced, uh, particularly the operational and technical challenges of scaling up the response at community level, scaling up surveillance providing extra support to, to laboratory diagnostics, <clears throat> amongst other things. Um, WHO is working with South Africa to provide surge capacity in, in very specific technical areas, um, and we are also providing virtual support, in, in fact, a virtual mission uh, as well to support that. So uh, a number of key uh, uh, individuals at global and at regional level will be both providing physical on-site support to the response as well as virtual support in the coming days. Uh, <clears throat> South Africa has a tremendous internal capacity in public health. It has, uh, it has done a good job in responding to what has been an escalating situation uh, and it is only wise uh, and uh, as smart that a, a responsible government will reach out for whatever assistance it feels that it needs to add to the quality and intensity of its response. And Ch oh yeah, on the mission, yeah, well, uh, yes, well, we, I'm not quite sure if they're there yet, but uh, our small team is uh, hopefully on its way <coughs> uh, to, to Beijing, uh, or, or will be very, very soon. Uh, we've been engaged in a series of uh, virtual consultations again with uh, scientific and other colleagues at the National Health Commission at the China CDC uh, in looking at work already done on the um, uh, preliminary or earlier investigations and scientific uh, studies on, on the origin of the virus. Uh, we continue to look at the opportunities for scientific collabora collaboration and the terms of reference for an international mission and uh, we're already beginning to reach out to experts uh, at the international level f um, to see who will be available and most appropriate to be able to support uh, an international mission in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, again, as I said previously, the logistics of that are not straightforward, I can assure you, but we are pleased uh, that the, the, we now see the level of engagement that I think uh, is important and will drive a successful mission. Uh, these are important questions. Uh, the answers uh, are even more important, and I think everybody in the Chinese scientific community and the international scientific community is anxious to move forward with the appropriate studies to fully understand the animal origins of this virus. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Did you want to say anything more about South Africa or no? You want me to say more? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, thank you, Sophie. I think um, Mike had covered it uh, very well. Uh, we had a very productive meeting uh, with His Excellency Minister Moel, Moenzi, Moel uh, Zueli, <laughs> Minister Zueli, my uh, brother. Uh, and uh, the, um, you know, we have been interacting all along. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, a regular uh, contact. And um, uh, we have agreed to boost our uh, cooperation. And as Mike said, uh, all levels participated from our country office, regional and, and, and headquarters. And we will increase the frequency of our uh, engagement. And based on some of the um, requests that uh, South Africa has uh, already uh, done. So uh, we will uh, intensify our uh, cooperation and uh, uh, I hope to make, make uh, progress uh, in controlling the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. The next question comes from Morocco, from Monsieur, and I apologize if I get your name wrong, El Buktawi from MAP Morocco. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, Mr. El Bektawi, can you hear us uh, from Morocco? It sounds like we've lost him. So we'll go on. Uh, we have a question from Spain, from Isabel, from EFE, from the Spanish Newswire. Isabel, could you unmute yourself and go ahead with your question?
Do you hear me? Very well. Uh, please proceed. Hello? Hello, Isabel, we can hear I you. I don't hear anything, sorry. I don't know if you are uh, hearing. We are hearing you. Uh, can you hear us? It sounds like we've got some technical problems. We'll send Isabel a message to let, tell her she can ask her question a little later. Uh, we have Imogen, Imogen Fuchs, BBC. <laughs> Let's hope we do better with you. Imogen, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, Margaret. Yeah, I hope that, that I'm the exception to the rule that you can hear me. Well done. Um, I just wonder, I know you have been very quiet on this, but we had these quite uh, surprising comments from US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in London on Tuesday. Um, do you have any response to that? Or... <sighs> Could you give us an idea of how you, how you think a big organization like the WHO can, can respond to that kind of comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we, have, uh, we haven't kept quiet, actually. We released a statement. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, the comments uh, were done, I think, on Tuesday, last Tuesday. And the comments are untrue and unacceptable and without any foundation for that matter. And our sole uh, focus uh, and the focus of the international, the entire organization is on saving lives. If there is one thing that really matters to us and which should matter to the entire uh, international community, it's saving uh, lives. And WHO will not be di distracted by these comments, and uh, uh, we don't want the entire the international community also to be distracted. As you know, one of the greatest uh, uh, threats we face continues to be the politicization of the pandemic. COVID-19 does not respect borders, ideologies, or political parties. And I, say, I have said it many times, COVID politics should be quarantined. And I'm appealing again uh, to all nations uh, to work together. Politics and uh, partisanship have made uh, things uh, worse. So what is very important is science, solutions, and solidarity. But I repeat, the allegations are untrue and without any foundation. Thank you. If I, if I might add, um, I feel the need to say something as an American, as a proud uh, WHO employee. Um, I have had the honor and privilege to sit next to Dr. Tedros and Dr. Mike Ryan uh, for I don't know how many days since the beginning of this pandemic. And I have never been more proud to be WHO I have worked for this organization, with this organization, for more than 10 years. We have dedicated staff in all of our regions and in countries working all over the world. We have partners that continue to work with us and engage with us. And I am particularly grateful for those that continue to show their support for us. But I see firsthand every day the work that Dr. Tedros does, that Mike does, that our teams do all over the world. We are firmly focused on saving lives as Dr. Tedros has said, firmly focused. We will not be distracted. Um, and that is what we remain, uh, and we will continue to remain focused on. Um, and just on that, uh, many of us uh, have worked uh, seven days a week, 20 hours a day for the last uh, seven months. Uh, everything we think, everything we do is focused on trying to save lives. Uh, and we send, and have sent for years, our people into harm's way every day. Uh, many of us have spent months and years on the front line, uh, risking our lives and worrying our families for, for decades in this fight 
uh, for social justice. Uh, it's, it's really important that we try and maintain the morale of all frontline workers, be they WHO, the rest of the UN. Uh, and uh, I can say, too, that uh, none of us are perfect, but we all serve. We serve to save lives. Uh, and we're here in the service of the vulnerable people of the world. And again, I am proud to sit by the side of uh, Dr. Tedras in doing that, because uh, uh, our organization and his leadership are intertwined. Um, and we have benefited from that leadership, from that direction, from a transformation in our organization. And I can say this as someone who's spent a quarter of a century associated with this organization, transformation that I thought might never come for an organization that truly needed to change the way it did business. I've seen that happen. Uh, we are committed to that. We are proud, proud to be WHO, and we will remain so, and we will serve the vulnerable people of the world, <clears throat> regardless of what is said about us. Thank you so much, DG, and Dr. Van Kerkhoff, and Dr. Dr. Ryan. I can only, I'm not meant to say anything, but proud to be WHO now more than ever. The next question goes to uh, Chen Waiwa from China Daily. Chen, could you unmute yourself and please go ahead. Hi, uh, uh, Dr. Tedros, so you just mentioned uh, in the opening remarks that uh, half of the cases uh, came from uh, three countries. We all know that's US, uh, Brazil, India. Uh, so my question is, uh, has W HO focused the uh, special resources on these three countries to put them on the right trajectory. Uh, because, you know, doc, as Dr. Ryan mentioned uh, about the coercive measure, I, I sort of find it confusing because, uh, like some US congressmen uh, rejecting wearing masks, masks, they say, that I have a facial autonomy. So that sounds ridiculous to me, but I don't know. Is this uh, coercive if I? ask you to wear a mask. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think the, the three countries you mentioned are powerful, able, democratic uh, countries who have tremendous internal capacities uh, to deal with this disease. And there are many, hundreds of thousands of brave frontline workers, doctors, nurses, hygienists, uh, logisticians and others who fight in the front lines, just like in every other country. Uh, you know, it is a given. Large countries can have large problems because by their very nature they are large, they are populous, they are complex. Um, and, uh, and, and also uh, there are differences of opinion and differences between the federal and the state level in many countries in all over the world. It's one of the prices that countries pay for, for that uh, for democracy in, in, in that context. So uh, uh, we are always ready and will always remain ready to provide advice, input and service to any of our member states, wherever they are, uh, and constantly offer advice and support to them. Uh, but these, uh, these, particularly these three countries and many more, have tremendous internal capacities um, and I believe uh, can turn uh, this around because of the nature of their public health, their science, uh, and their, their innate capacities to fight this uh, disease. And I trust that these three countries are doing that and will do that and will escalate and, and, and upgrade their responses in order to, 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 to bring this disease under control. Maria? And just to add on the legal topic, um, one of the reasons that we've set up this new law lab is to help countries to better understand how they can legislate for the response. As Dr. Ryan said, it's a matter of balance between making sure that people uh, voluntarily work with us to make sure that we save lives. But in cases where legislation is necessary, we're trying to provide countries with good, good advice about what's, what, what, what good legislation looks like that will help, us, help those countries to, to deal with things like the compulsory wearing of masks in appropriate circumstances and to deal with quarantine in appropriate circumstances. And that's where the legal lab comes in, to help countries to better understand what other countries are doing and to share information about how they can make appropriate laws which follow WHO guidelines and help save lives. If I could just briefly add um, to say that um, 
you know, to supplement uh, what Mike has said, that you know, we stand ready to support all countries everywhere. Um, I think uh, many people, certainly in, in my uh, friends and family, um, perhaps thought we were here really to support maybe lower income countries or lower resource countries, but we are here to help all countries. And we work through our regional offices and we work through our country offices to provide support to everyone everywhere. And I think just a message uh, to say that even in those three countries that have the highest numbers of cases right now can be turned around. It can be turned around. And there are tools that all countries have um, that can do that. Um, it takes tremendous will, it takes tremendous leadership and the work of all people to be part of the solution and to play their role. And what Dr. Tedros was speaking about today in his speech and what you've heard us say many times is everyone has a role to play. And so when you are thinking about the steps that you need to take to present, prevent yourself from getting infected, you're not only protecting yourself, you're protecting others that live around you, that you live with, that you socialize with. So continue to practice physical distancing, continue to clean your hands, continue to adhere to the recommendations that are put in place for your safety. Continue to know where that virus is and learn everything you can about this virus. Because as we do every day, we're learning something every day. And some of our guidance may be adapted. Some of the guidance and recommendations in your area may be adapted based on that current situation. So keep yourself well informed about how you can protect yourself, your family, and your community. Margaret, I just may add to that WHO's regional office for the Southeast Asia is based in, in Delhi under the leadership of uh, Dr. Poonam Singh, who herself is Indian. And uh, one of our largest country offices in the world is actually uh, in India and works very closely with the Indian government. Similarly, one of our strongest offices in the Americas you know, is in Brazil. And we work with both the federal and state level and have worked together very successfully on the management of dengue, yellow fever, and other diseases. So they, the, 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 those countries are intertwined uh, with us. Uh, obviously, the United States is not in need of uh, our assistance uh, most of the time, but certainly the U.S., and I've said this before, the U.S. government is deeply, uh, and its institutions, particularly its scientific institutions, are deeply entwined with global health and providing uh, strong scientific uh, and public health input to so many global health agendas over the last 10 or 20 years. So uh, these um, countries are not only important in the COVID response, but each of them uh, has a tremendous uh, contribution to make at the global level. And it is a time when we do need global leadership and, and, and large countries that in regions very often set a standard for others. They set an example and other countries follow. And people look to India, people look to Brazil, people look to the United States for leadership, for examples, for ways of doing business. Uh, and they tend, when those are successful, to copy those strategies. So these countries are not only important in their own right, they're very important as regional and global beacons of, uh, of doing the right thing. Thank you for those comprehensive. So we now will, have, we will go to Priti Patniak from here in Geneva, Geneva Health Files. Priti, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Please, yes, yes, Hello. very well. Yes, um, yes. my question um, is basically, um, I wanted to find out uh, whether uh, WHO is uh, concerned about the lukewarm response uh, it has received for the COVID-19 tech pool. Um, is there an update that you can share? Uh, we see that not as many countries have signed up as, uh, as one hoped. Um, and it's, is it possible to share some details on what kind of technology you expect to be shared and so on? Thanks for taking my question. Oh, the Costa Rican initiative, yes, yes. Um, I, we would have to get back to you on the details. Your, your question is well asked but I don't have the specific details on the number of countries and the technologies that are currently on the CTAP platform. So uh, what I propose we do is we get that information, we send it through Margaret to you and, and maybe bring, on Monday we will also maybe uh, give a couple of minutes to give an update on CTAP, if that's okay with you. 
excellent question, and just send it to me, harrism at who.int, and we'll, we'll make sure we, you get a good answer. Uh, the next question is for um, Isabel. We're going to try. Isabel has reconnected. Isabel from FA. So, Isabel, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. Do you hear me? Very well. Please ask your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for trying again. Thank you. Uh, my question is: As you know, there are several outbreaks in Spain, and most of them, uh, are, even if they are. Uh, restricted to a few geographical zones. Uh, this is happening after you warned that uh, we we should have been uh, very careful after the, the confinement. And I would like to hear from you what is the lesson we have to learn in Spain and in other countries. In this context, uh, a quite important proportion of these contaminations happen in nightclubs, as you mentioned. Do you think that uh, it's most, most reasonable uh, to close these sites until the situation is under control? Um, uh, I, think the, the, I think we have to be uh, careful here that when we see clusters of cases or a rise in cases after uh, lockdowns are lifted, that in some way th that, that is projected as an error or a fault or a failing. It, it happens. The minute you raise the pressure on the virus and the virus is a community level, you will see uh, sporadic or clusters of cases. The question you should ask is what is the reaction to that? What we've seen is in areas that have lifted restrictions very early without having control on the virus have seen a very fast jump back up. But in other countries, even in countries that have brought the disease under extreme control, like Germany and Spain and others, where the numbers have been suppressed to very low levels, that when you open up, there's always a chance that the disease can be imported or the disease can spread from unseen clusters. Um, and the real, I suppose, test uh, of uh, community and government is how quickly can you get those under control? How quickly can you detect the cluster? How quickly can you test the people in that cluster? How quickly can you get the results from that? How quickly can you identify the contacts? How quickly can you identify the risk factors? Was the risk factor a nightclub? Was the risk factor a mass gathering? What do you need to do at the community level to prevent that happening again? Do you need to implement some local movement restrictions? What we're really trying to get here is move from, as I've said before, using a very big hammer to trying to be more precise in what, what we're doing. Instead of restricting everyone, we try and go after the virus, uh, and we try and identify where the virus is, and then specifically and surgically, in a sense, excise the virus from the community by minimizing the impact on the lives and livelihoods uh, of the community by focusing in on cases, on contacts, on investigation. So countries coming out of lockdown, even countries with low levels of disease, will experience potential cases and clusters of disease. And I believe in this case, uh, Spain, uh, like many other countries, um, have reacted uh, quickly, they've reacted well, um, and are, uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the incidence of disease is, 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 is stable, uh, and yet we still have to deal with uh, a few of these clusters that have emerged in a number of countries. So um, I think and that is really how we get to what the DG spoke about. We have to learn to live with this virus. We will not be able to eliminate or eradicate this virus uh, in the foreseeable future. And we have to learn to find a way to get back to our lives, to get back to some kind of normality, to do that with, uh, as uh, Dave has spoken about, with respect to human rights, with respect to the use of law, with using every single tool that we have as a society to suppress this virus in a sustainable way, to make maximum disruption to the virus and minimum disruption to ourselves. Now, how do we go about doing that? And we need everybody on board. The DG spoken, it's not just the authorities on board, it's not just uh, the responsibility of the authorities, it's also of communities and people within those communities. And more and more the youth, and not just uh, the older ones, the old fogies like myself and others, youth culture, can break this. Uh, youth culture can help drive this pandemic or youth activism can help break the back uh, on this virus. And going to the issue then of closing sites, <clears throat> everything about gathering is related to the background incidence of the disease in the community. 
If there is no disease in the community, then it's safe to re-engage in normal activities. If disease is in the community and if you have intense community transmission, then any activity that brings people together in crowds, especially indoors, will lead to further transmission of the disease. Because if you don't know where the virus is, but you do know the virus is spread uh, in your community, and you bring people together in large groups, you're going to get transmission. Uh, and in that sense, governments are going to have to make decisions based on the local epidemiology as to whether things like bars and clubs in particular circumstances need to be closed or have restricted uh, numbers or whatever it is they need to do to reduce the chance of person-to-person -person transmission. Maria? Thanks. I, I really appreciate the question because I think so many people are dealing specifically with this question. Um, of uh, what are the lessons that, that can be learned, you know, once you've been successful at suppressing transmission, you know, what about these sporadic cases and clusters that are, that are starting to um, appear? I think the lesson is, is that we should expect this. We should be ready for this to happen. And with all of the systems that are in place now, which countries have worked so hard to put in place, they need to be used fast. They need to be used aggressively and robustly and with no regrets with the exception of ensuring that p when these interventions are put back in place again, where you may shut down something temporarily, it's done for a temporary amount of time, and it's done in this, the lowest or smallest geographic region as possible. I think everyone wants to avoid these huge so-called lockdown measures again. We do too. We, we hope that we don't need to see these again. Um, but if these outbreaks are dealt with swiftly. Um, if the test, treat, contact trace, care for, if all of that is put in place and done really quickly, you have an opportunity to really put that fire out quickly. And we are seeing countries do that. I think it's important to know where, as, as, as Mike has said, where these outbreaks are occurring. Is it in a particular entertainment sector? Is it in a long-term living facility? Is it in another closed settings? And if you, as an individual, have uh, a, an opportunity to avoid going to a nightclub, maybe it's worth avoiding that nightclub for a little while. I've never, I don't think we've talked so much about nightclubs in, 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 in recent days and recent weeks because these tend to be the hot spots right now. But I think having a blanket of closing all nightclubs is not the solution either. I think we need to have a data-driven approach. Where is the virus? Where are the opportunities for the virus to transmit? If it happens to be in a certain area, then yes, perhaps maybe they need to be closed for a little while. But again, you have a, you have a choice yourself to, to make and say, do I do this? Do I go to this? I said the other day, there's a lot of things that people want to be doing. Um, I do too. We all do here. But there's not necessarily things we, we need to do, the things we need to do to keep our family safe and alive. And, um, and we need to make, perhaps make some sacrifices ourselves so that essential workers and frontline workers who are putting themselves at risk every day to keep businesses going to serve us food, um, for healthcare workers who are out there who are caring for patients, they need to go to work. And they choose to go to work proudly. Um, and we are very grateful for that. So again, we all have a, a role to play. Um, and we really do need to make decisions based on risk um, to keep ourselves safe and keep our families safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhove. The next question, we are going to try to go back to Morocco, and, and I believe that Ms. Monsieur El Baktoui has reconnected. So, Monsieur El Baktoui, please um, unmute yourself and ask your question. Looks like we are not, we're out of luck today. Um, we have come up to the, the six o'clock, we've come up to the end of the hour, so I'll close this press conference, but of course I will hand it over to the Director General for final words. Thank you, thank you, Margaret. Thank you to all who have uh, joined us uh, today, and uh, see you on Monday in our next uh, uh, presser. So thank you again.